people do. I was really into that last hymn. I almost forgot to come up here. <laughs> thank you. But thank you, everybody, for being here today. Um, I know that we have gone over these items in the bulletin before, um, but I did want to remind some folks because August is already halfway through. So we have some things coming up at the end and then also in September. So just a reminder, um, we had called or held some Bible studies prior and they went really well. They were very meaningful. Um, Pastor Dunsky was gracious enough to offer those again. Those are coming up and we'll start on September 6th. There's a lot of information in the bulletin and we'd love to see people there for that. Um, another one is Sue's East Coast. We've been covering this throughout the summer, um, but keep in mind that that's going to be now throughout September. And then again, the Worship and Music Committee has been new. Um, that's going to be from Sunday the 20th to the 27th. So if you'd like to participate in that, we'll meet up here by Sue afterwards. Um, but other than that, let's go ahead and prepare for an awesome Sunday of worship.
to join us. Uh, if you can only come for one, come for one. If you can uh, come for a half a dozen, come for a half a dozen. Okay, so uh, we'd love to have you join us. Uh, I don't know if there are there any other announcements. I hope you're having a, a marvelous weekend. And of course, uh, we kind of put the, uh, the top on it, the crown on it, by worshiping together. And we do that because the Holy Spirit calls us together as the people of God. We worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sins to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sins, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not come up to you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always.
How the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above, and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God. And for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for this holy house, for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Let us pray. O God, our defender, Storms rage around and within us, cause us to be afraid. Rescue your people from despair, deliver your sons and daughters from fear, and preserve us in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. taken from First Kings chapter 19, beginning with the ninth verse. On Mount Horeb, where God had appeared to Moses with the little signs of God's presence, earthquake, wind, and fire, Elijah now experienced God in sheer silence. God assured Elijah that he is not the only faithful believer. 7,000 Israelites are still loyal. God instructed Elijah to anoint two men as kings and to anoint Elijah as a as his own successor. And now we read. At Horeb, the mouth of God, Elijah came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I am, I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks and pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Ahab. Also you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elijah, son of Shaphat of Abel Mahola, as a prophet in your place. Whoever escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu, Jehu shall kill. And whoever escaped from the sword of Jehu, Elijah said, shall kill. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to bow, and every mouth that have not kissed him. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God. We will read responsibly from Psalm 85, beginning of the 8th verse. I will listen to what the Lord God is saying, for you speak peace to your faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to you. That fast love and faithfulness have met together, righteousness and peace have kissed each other. The Lord 
will indeed grant prosperity, and our land will yield its increase. The second reading is taken from the book of Romans, chapter 10, beginning with the fifth verse. A right relationship with God is not something we achieve by heroic effort. It is a gift received in the proclamation whose content is Jesus Christ. This proclaimed word creates our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hence, Christian proclamation is an indispensable component of God's saving action. And now we read. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is, the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart, and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth, and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But now, are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The word of the Lord. Please rise in preparation for the gospel. I wait for you, O oh Lord, and your word is my hope. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, o Lord. In Matthew's Gospel, uh, evangelists typically portray Jesus' disciples as people of little faith who fail despite their best intentions. In this story, Matthew shows how Jesus comes to the disciples when they are in trouble and sustains them in their time of fear and doubt. Here's the reading. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of, to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. While he dismissed the crowds, and after he had dismissed the crowd, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, the coast, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me! And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, I did doubt. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord. Please be seated. I tried to figure out some of the themes 
that are in these lessons for the day. And I came upon one that I think is, is really significant for, for you and me. But to get at it, I, I picked another short text from the Epistle of James that I think summarizes this very well. He writes, Come now, you who say, Tomorrow, today or tomorrow, we will do such, go to such and such a town, and spend a year there doing business and making money. Yet you do not even know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wishes, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, commits sin. That's the end of the text. Have you ever heard of the pastor who was out painting his fence one day? And he was meditating on this passage from the book of James and on the fact that life is so brief. And about that time, a man came along pulling a horse. The pastor looked up and said, where are you going with that horse? The man said, well, I'm going to go to town to sell it. And the pastor said to him, you know, you ought to say that you're going to sell it if it's the Lord's will. And the man said, the Lord's will's got nothing to do with it. I raised this horse, and I'm going to sell it. The pastor said, I'm telling you that life is short. You ought to say, if it be the Lord's will. The man said, look, I raised this horse to sell. I've got an appointment with a potential buyer, and the Lord's will doesn't have anything to do with it. And with that, he walked off dragging the horse. Well, the pastor kept on painting the fence. And about an hour and a half later, he looked up, and, and here comes the man walking back toward him. His pants and boots are gone. He's trying to cover himself up with his shirt tail. His face was cut and his hair was a mess. The pastor said, what in the world happened to you? The man said, well, I, I stayed here and, and talked to you so bloom and long that I was late for my appointment. So I cut across the cornfield to save time. And the farmer who owns the field saw my horse, but he didn't see me, and he shot my horse. And the horse fell on me, kicked me in the eye, and I couldn't get up from under him without, out under him without pulling off my, my boots and breeches. I got up, and the farmer started shooting me. Getting the way I caught myself in a barbed wire fence. That's what happened to me. The pastor said, well, where are you going now? And the man said, well, I'm going home, if it be the Lord's will. In this little epistle lesson that I read, James tells us to be careful. Making plans about buying and selling, he says, we should always say, I will do such and such if it is the Lord's will. What's he mean by that? Well, for one thing, he is affirming the uncertainty of life. Your plans are made. You're getting ready for a trip. 
And then all of a sudden, you trip and fall. Bones are shattered, there's surgery, and all the plans, maybe even life itself, are changed. Several years ago, our family we were driving to Wisconsin, and it was winter, and we were almost to Gary, Indiana, and the traffic started getting really heavy. All of a sudden, we hit a patch of ice. Uh, we had one of those big conversion vans in those days, and they went into a skid. We spun completely around on our side of the turnpike, and then we headed toward the median strip. Well, you know how that is between those two sides. Down into the valley, fortunately we weren't there where there was a, a, an abutment or anything, and up on the other side, and somehow moving straight, and it was, it was a miracle that we didn't, we didn't roll over, and then on to the other turnpike lane, where once again we spun around, right in front of the coming traffic. We came to rest on the berm facing in the wrong direction. And uh, Indiana Turnpike construction truck went past and we looked at it. We were sitting there weak kneed, crying because we came pretty close to dying and killing a whole bunch of other people. Someone up there must have been looking for us, looking after us. Because who could have predicted such a thing? Are things like that providence or merely coincidence? I suspect that there's one thing in life that you and I, on which we can all agree, that is life is unpredictable. And people who figure that they've got their lives all figured out and tightly under control are, are simply misleading themselves. What would happen if your job was taken away from you, if, if your stocks lost even more value than what they are now, if the market crashed, and it, and it happened, it has before. Suppose you were out on the road this evening and out of the blue, a drunk driver crossed the road and you became another tragic statistic. Or suppose you were to win the lottery like that guy who won the what, a billion and a half bucks this last week. Who knows what tomorrow is going to bring? Life is unpredictable. And that's one thing that James is surely saying, the scripture says. And another is that ultimately, we question this sometimes, but ultimately God is in control of his creation. I don't think any of us would argue with that really. We might argue a bit about how much control God chooses to exercise in our lives. There, but we know that there are Christians who believe that everything happens as a direct result of God's will. And there are others who are equally sincere. 
to believe that God has created a lawful world and that everything happens according to his lawful creation. That he may under certain circumstances, remarkable circumstances intervene, but most things just simply happen according to God's law. Now which of those is right? You can say it. Obviously we're not God. We do know though that however God chooses to act, His way is best. According to an ancient legend, a certain small village sought to strike a bargain, a bargain with God. They had been experiencing many years of poor harvests. They thought they could improve on God's way of doing things. And so they asked God for permission to plan the weather for next year's harvest. God agreed. Whenever they asked for rain, God sent rain. Whenever they asked for sun, God sent sun. That year the corn and the wheat were higher and thicker than ever before. When the harvest came, though, the farmers discovered that the tall corn had no ears, and the thick wheat had no heads of grain. They complained bitterly to God. God replied, what? Come on, guys. When you asked for the rain, I gave it to you. When you asked for sunshine, I gave it to you. You never asked, though, for the harsh north wind. Because without the winds, there's no pollination. And with no pollination, there's no crop. We may not understand God's ways, but we know his heart, what he showed us in Jesus. We learn that God is for us. We know that he can be trusted. And in our hearts, we know his way is best. I know that sometimes it's difficult for our, our faith to affirm that fact. Some of us have had difficult blows in our lives. We're like the farmer who had a, a fine ewe, which gave birth to two lambs. And when one, one lamb died, he remarked, well, I guess I'd rather have one fat lamb than two skinny ones. Still later, the other lamb died. And he reflected, well, I guess that's all for the best. Now that you won't have to be bothered by it. And a week later, when the ewe died, the farmer was still philosophical. Well, it's all for the best, he said. But I'll be darned if I can figure out why. We can sympathize with that. The ways of God are not always our ways. Still, we trust in his divine care. He is in control of his creation. That we can be sure. James wants us to know that. That's part of what the text of Scripture tells us over and over and over again. And so before leaving here this morning, I want to stress something that James is not saying. Because of the way things are, he's not saying that you and I are to passively accept whatever life sends us 
as the will of God. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about the person who caves in. Caves in too easy when life gets rough. I'm talking about the person who is content to sit on his or her sofa and whine, well, if it's for God's will, I guess I just have to accept it. If God wants me to have a job, he will open the right door. All I have to do is sit and wait for him. You know, the Christian faith a lot of times has been given a bad name by people who excuse their timidity, excuse their irresponsibility, and their outright laziness by blaming everything on God's will. I'll tell you, they didn't get that faith from Jesus. Jesus' faith was an active faith. It was not only about asking, but seeking and knocking. That's what he was showing us in his own life. He praised the widow who persisted until she got what she needed. He praised others who were doers, who were risk takers, movers and shakers, we might call them today. The man with five talents, who did something with his talents and was praised, while the one who hid his talent in the ground was condemned. Even the dishonest steward was cast in a good light because he took charge of his own situation. There is no foundation in all of the Gospels or any of the epistles for the whiny kind of passiveness that excuses every situation as God's will. Put it another way. There are times when a Christian needs to know how to fight. For example, research shows us that people can sometimes improve their odds in battling cancer if they don't give up. The person who caved in himself says, oh well, this is just God's will. May very well be decreasing their odds of staying alive. There are times when a Christian needs to fight. For example, sometimes God calls us to battle injustice or oppression. Indeed, life itself is a battle. God needs us to fight the good fight with everything that is within us. There's an ancient fable about the man who was walking through a forest and he saw a fox who had lost its legs. He wondered how that fox lived. And then he saw a tiger come in with, with game in his mouth and the tiger had its fill and, and left the rest of the meat for the fox. Next day, the same thing happened again. And the man began to praise God for providing for the fox and said to himself, I too shall just rest in a corner with full trust in the Lord and he will provide me with all I need. He did this for many days, but nothing happened. Nothing at all. He almost starved. He was near death's door when he heard a voice say, Oh, you who are in the path of error, open your eyes to the truth. Follow the example of the tiger and stop imitating the disabled fox. Good advice for us. 
There's a lot of honest truth in that. We are not to depend on God for matters that we can handle ourselves. We know life is unpredictable. With our little brains, we can't hope to figure it out. In everything we do, it would be wise to acknowledge that, that the future really lies beyond our control. But we also know that God is ultimately in control. And we know that he can be trusted. We know that in all things, he works the good of those who love him. I think I read that in the Bible. And finally, we know that there are areas of life that are our responsibility. We are to give our best. Give our best in everything that we do. Trusting that God will supply what we may be lacking. James says that we ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live, and we shall do this or that, and that's true. Tomorrow is in God's hands. Much of this world he has entrusted to us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
our joys and concerns, let us offer our prayers for the church, those in need, and all of creation. God of grace and faith, your faithfulness is never ending, and your righteousness becomes ours through Christ Jesus. Send the church to proclaim the gospel both near and far, in church buildings and on street corners in person and through digital means. Hear us, O oh God. God of sky and sea, the plants, animals, mountains, and plains, proclaim your glory. Prosper the work of ecologists as they teach us new ways to care for the environment. Bring relief to areas recovering from natural disasters. Hear us, O oh God. God of peace and justice, you call us to live as your beloved community throughout the world. Instill in all local, regional, national, and global leaders a desire to work for the well-being of all people. Hear us, O oh God. God of care and compassion, you bring assurance when we are afraid. Bring calm to any who are anxious or fearful. Bless the work of therapists, nurses, and other health care providers. Comfort all who grieve and soothe any who are sick. Hear us, O oh God. God of wonder, you accompany us in both joys and sorrows. We pray for children and teachers preparing for a new school year. Make your presence known in our work and play, in lively conversation, and in quiet rest. Hear us, O oh God. God of new life, you send people to renew both church and society. We give you thanks for their lives of faithful service as examples of following your call. Hear us, O oh God. Into your hands, O oh God, we commend all for whom we pray in the name of the one who reconciled all creation to himself, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
Christ on the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, All of you drink of it. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Come to the banquet, for all is now ready. And now we would invite those who have the elements at their seat to commune. First, the body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Now we invite the rest of the congregation to come forward.
Now may the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, his precious blood, strengthen and preserve you unto eternal life. Amen. Let us pray. God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your Spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God blesses us and sends us in mission to the world. May our God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen.
Good morning.